I'm delighted to welcome our guest today, Joseph McBride. Joseph is an attorney who has been representing various January 6th defendants. Joseph, thanks for being here. It's good to be here, Danielle. Thank you for having me. Of course. Well, I wanted to start out by asking you, what inspired you to decide to take on some of these January 6th defendants? Uh, That is a great question. To make a long story very short, I became an attorney because my brother Anthony was wrongfully convicted and sentenced to 15 years of incarceration for a crime he did not do. My brother's wrongful conviction and subsequent incarceration inspired me to become an attorney and to fight against an unjust uh, system that I knew was corrupt from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top. So when I got my first January 6th call, it was a natural progression in my career and what I believe to be a calling to continue to fight for people who are wrongfully uh, wrongfully accused or, and or maliciously prosecuted by the, the United States government. Wow. So was it after January 6th that you realized this was something you wanted to reach out to them? You wanted to find a way to help out some of those defendants? I got a call uh, in February of 2021 from Richard Barnett. He was in a cell next to uh, Jake Lang, who's represented by my colleague, Stephen Metcalf. Uh, Jake essentially passed the message to Steve. Do you got somebody else who's out there who may be willing to help? Uh, I got the call from Steve. I thought about it, prayed about it, and uh, God said yes. My family said yes. I said yes. And I took Richard's case on Ash Wednesday of 2021. Wow. Well, give us a little bit of an update on some of the cases you've been working on and how it's been going with some of the defendants you've been working with. Uh, so with regard to Richard Barnett, his case was supposed to be uh, begin trial on December 12th. He is out. The government is still uh, giving us discovery. And the most uh, controversial charge, which is the 1512 charge, the obstruction charge, is going to be argued at the uh, circuit level in D.C. on that same day. So for various reasons, we were able to get the case adjourned for a trial to January 9th. That'll be the first actual trial that we have coming up. Ryan Nichols uh, was incarcerated for almost two years. We just got him out two weeks ago, or maybe even less than that, so that he could begin the process of being able to prepare for trial. He was held in under, he was held in egregious conditions that violated his human and constitutional rights. We were able to get him out under a limited carve out under the Bail Reform Act for the specific purpose of being able to prepare for trial something he could not do in a meaningful way while incarcerated. So he is home with his family now. I am happy to report, and he will begin the process of preparing for trial. So Richard Barnett, uh, we got him out. We got Ryan Nichols out. We got Adam Jackson out as well a few months ago. So they're kind of in the same boat, preparing for trial at home. Daniel Goodwin as well, preparing for trial at home. And then you have Christopher Quaglin, who is still uh, incarcerated, He is down almost 60 pounds right now. He's dying. Uh, We need to get him out. We need to get him into a position where he can see his discovery and go through his discovery in a way that makes sense. Right now, even if he had a computer in front of him, which he certainly does not, he would not be able to process the information because he's down some 60 pounds. So we need to get Chris out. We're hoping to have uh, an answer to our motion for reconsideration in his case shortly. And then uh, it's the march to trial for hit for those cases that I've spoken about and a few others as well. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And do you feel like a lot of it depends on who their judge is, who they get in these things? Because sometimes it, it could be someone who's just very leftist and kind of has it out for them before they even hear the case. Um, sometimes maybe it could be someone who hopefully actually listens to the facts. But do you find that there's sometimes some variability there? I have to be very careful how I answer that question because I have to appear in front of these judges uh, on a regular basis. Okay, we don't want to. We don't want to get any of them in trouble. It's a great question, and what I what I'll say is this, Danielle. uh, Yes, your instincts are right. Hmm. Well, I guess I'll say my view. I think that it really does, and I hope that many of these people are fortunate. Maybe they'll appear before a Trump appointee or something, but. A lot of the judges, especially appointed by Democrats, I mean, I think Trump was truthing about this, but a lot of them are very loyal to their side only. They're kind of want to punish many people on the other side, whereas a lot of judges that are appointed by conservatives are 
much more open to hearing the actual facts of a particular case. And it's not about purely who they are loyal to. Um, and sometimes I think these more Democrat leaning judges want to punish the uh, defendants, make them really sorry for what they did and so on and give them very harsh sentences. Of course, you mentioned how some of them are even losing a lot of weight in jail. Do you have any stories to share about some of the the inside stories from the defendants while they're incarcerated? Of course. Uh, as a general matter, what we have right now is what we, we're calling the D.C. Gulag system. So D.C. jail was the original place where everybody was sent to uh, be held pretrial. People were re- routinely tortured there. We're talking about American citizens, the majority of them, uh, without any criminal histories of any kind. A substantial portion of them are veterans, honor- honorably discharged. Some of them have gone to war for this country and bled for this country, and they've been treated there uh, in a horrible fashion. I've had multiple members. I've worked with multiple members of Congress to raise awareness to this issue. Marjorie Taylor Greene, Louis Gohmert, Troy Nails, Clay Higgins, Andy Biggs, Matt Gates. These are some of the people who have been speaking up about this since Jump Street. And they've been saying, hey, that this is wrong. So because of the level of attention that had to come to these issues, they began to uh, move prisoners from the D.C. Gulag itself to various prisons in Virginia. So we call it the gulag system because they're really, it's really just a constellation of gulags at this point. There's one place in Virginia called Northern Neck Regional Jail, which is particularly horrible. That is where Chris Quaglin and a few other January 6th detainees are being held. It's not just horrible there for January 6ers. It's historically horrible for largely the African American population that's incarcerated there as well. And of course, you know, everybody else, but African Americans are largely over, overrepresented in that jail. January 6ers, however, uh, get a particular level of, of, of harm. There's a little bit more hate in all the speech. There's a little bit more elbow grease in all the pushes. And that is because the warden there, uh, and, or the, the superintendent, who I should, who I, uh, superintendent is the correct term for him, who acts like the warden and the people in that jail and in the DC uh, jail feel that they have a carte blanche authority to treat these prisoners any way they want without repercussions. So we're talking about starvation, beatings, long stints in solitary confinement, some of them for months and months at a time. Christopher Quaglin has done easily over a year in solitary confinement, probably closer to two years. They keep taking him out, putting him in, they call it whatever they want to call it, medical solitary confinement, administrative segregation, you name it, it doesn't matter. It is 24 hours a day or 22 hours a day or more of lockdown in the cell, absent meaningful human contact. They are routinely medically tortured. They're denied, they're, they're denied psychotropic medication. Christopher Worrell is another example, was, designed, was de- de- denied medication related to his cancer. They don't care about these guys who are veterans who are living with PTSD. They don't care about these guys who are coming in with pre-existing conditions like celiac disease and diabetes. They are slowly killing these men in order to disincentivize them from going to trial get them to take deals that they shouldn't take in order for the government to continue to put wins up on the board. But these wins that the government are putting up on the board, these convictions that they're getting, it's analogous to a baseball player who broke a record while on steroids. He may have the record on on paper, but you got that little asterisk next to his name because you know he cheated. And that's what's going on here. Be that as it may, we're going to pray, we're going to fight, we are going to do our best to represent these guys and win in this David versus Goliath battle. Because if we don't do it, uh, the the America that we all know and love will be over. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you mentioned how your brother uh, was wrongfully convicted, and many of these people are also being wrongfully convicted and mistreated. And I think it just it really does highlight the serious problems with our justice system because we don't want our, our justice system to behave like this, where they're becoming um, untrustworthy, punitive. Um, behaving in a way where people feel like this is all political. This is all just about torture. This is 1984 all over again. Um, but when you look forward and you think about maybe the January 6th committee shifting because we've taken the House back, do you think that may influence um, any of these cases or how January 6th is kind of looked at moving forward? I know Nancy Pelosi is maybe trying to hide some information regarding January 6th. Um, and I'm not sure if the committee will continue after her and 
decide to release this information because, as we know, there was actually FBI and other things involved there. It wasn't like, you know, what the left paints it out to be. Or do you think this may lead to the trials continuing in the harsh manner that they've always continued? So I think the answer is yes to both. And what I mean is, number one, they're going to continue for the trials to, to, to proceed harshly, as harshly as they can, because this Department of Justice has a minimum of two more years. Uh, it's assuming that Biden loses the next election. But let's just say two more years of Merrick Garland in the FBI and the DOJ uh, behaving like uh, – the Soviets or the Nazis and in terms of how they're pursuing and persecuting and jailing people. That is for sure. The, the silver lining here is that, as you've correctly stated, Danielle, that we have taken back the House, that these uh, committees will be repurposed. Uh, I hope that the January 6th committee is uh, repurposed and it is reformatted to, to actually search for the truth about what happened that day, starting with the uh, security failures and possible infiltration of, of government ag agents and or uh, saboteurs, provocateurs, so on and so forth, people who were paid informants, non-paid informants, people who cut deals, people who gave the FBI and the United States government intelligence months out. That whole thing could have been avoided. Why aren't we talking about this? That should be spoken about. The multitude of security failures that start with Nancy Pelosi and Mayor Muriel Bowser as well, that needs to be investigated. We need strong people in these committees, whether it's the January 6th committee or something else to lead. You need a Marjorie Taylor Greene. You need a Matt Gates, You need a Troy Nels. You need a Congressman Clay Higgins. You need somebody new who's coming in like Congressman Corey Mills out of Florida. This is a, a, a veteran, somebody who's a, a patriot, a business owner who ran not out of you know, personal need or personal gain. He ran because he loves this country. You get somebody like that in conjunction with those other players on these committees, you dig into the truth. And of course, it changes the game because the truth is what's going to cast out the falsehoods in these situations. Shining the light of truth into these situations is going to exonerate the majority of people who have been accused with January 6th related crimes, whether that is your January 6th protester on the ground or President Trump himself. And we have the people in place now to do it. The question is going to be is will the Republican leadership, will people like Kevin McCarthy um, get in line, support the truth, support what the American people want to see, and that is the quest for truth for January 6th. Absolutely. And I think so many people do want the truth. They want to know the facts. They want transparency. That's why I'm very excited. Elon Musk is hopefully going to release a lot of at least things going on from Twitter. I mean, the government basically uses Twitter as a way to reach people. So maybe we'll get some information there. Um, but when you're looking ahead to what you're hoping for these defendants, what would be kind of a, a um, I guess maybe we know the worst case scenario, but what would be the best case scenario, would you say, for some of the defendants coming out of this? The best case scenario would be a full exoneration uh, for these guys and for us to sue in civil court, which we're going to do for violations of their civil rights and for them to be compensated in the tens of millions of dollars for what has happened to them. Because what has happened to them should never happen to any American citizen. It is egregious. It is disgusting. It is un-American. It is illegal. It is wrong. And they have damaged these men psychologically, physically, their ability to generate income in this world. They have canceled them in the workplace. That needs to happen. Uh, we're going to sue no matter what the verdicts are in this case, in these cases, because their treatment inside these gulags is entirely unrelated to anything that they've been accused of that day. And... It's meaningful prison reform. You know, prison reform has been an issue that has been championed by the left, the ACLU, Amnesty International, the Legal Aid Society, all different organizations from the left have been the, the organizations that have championed prison reform uh, up until January 6th. All these organizations have jumped off of the map and they are nowhere to be found simply because the people who are now really being tortured are January Sixers, largely white, Christian, Republican, God and country loving men, and they don't want no part in helping them. So my appeal to the public, my appeal to the Democrats, my appeal to somebody like Corey Mills, uh, uh, not, not Corey Mills, the, the, the new gentleman from, from, from Brooklyn who's going to be uh, the, the, the minority leader in the House, is for the Democrats to reach out across the aisle and to say, hey, Prison reform is still important to us. 
prolonged solitary confinement, which is solitary confinement for more than 15 days at a time, should be banned at the national level. We should not be jailing and putting people in solitary who are pretrial detainees, people who have mental mental psychological issues or people who have physical sicknesses. We should adopt the Nelson Mandela rules as New York State did. We should ban these practices at the federal level, and primarily because these practices affect blacks and Latinos in this country more than anybody else. So these these, these are the constituents of the, uh, largely of the Democrats in urban areas. Now, we have a great amount of support for prison reform and for the banning of solitary and for the misuse of all these treatments at the federal level. And it's and it's Republican America first based Congress members who are willing, who are coming to the table, who are saying, hey, we missed this issue for the last hundred years. We got it wrong. But now that it's happened to our constituents, we understand what you've been talking about. We apologize for getting it wrong on the past. We hope to be able to work with you in the future. Is there something that we can do together? Is there a path forward to ban these practices against the American citizen? So if you are a Democrat uh, Congress person or a person in Senate, you should reach out to me or you should reach out to reach out to members of the Free Freedom Caucus and you should explore the possibility of putting down the gauntlet and doing what is best for the American people to ban these heinous and satanic practices in our prisons because they are evil. They have no place in American society and they are absolutely wrong. Yeah. I don't know if you saw Dave Chappelle's um, SNL monologue, but he talked about how all of these things that conservatives are pushing for right now, you know, with race and defunding the FBI, he was saying the blacks have been pushing for this as well, because a lot of the things happening to conservatives now are things that were happening to black people, um, many of whom are maybe conservative now. But I think that it does show that we we can't have this overpowerful government, whether that's our justice system or the prison system, because it can be misused and abused. And the larger the system becomes, the larger the cesspool becomes, the more room there is for them to torture people who are against them. And um, we're just seeing that happen on such a grand scale to these uh, defendants. Well, Joseph, good luck with everything. Keep us updated on how it goes. And we will definitely be keeping them in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you, Danielle. It's good to see you. God bless you and God bless America. 